Michael Redman from the Artesia Historical Museum and Art Center. We're going to chat about, uh, well, the exhibit there at the museum, Michael. But last week, uh, you were kind of sharing with us all kinds of great information about uh, Memorial Day, Veterans Day, and we kind of got into uh, militias and the starting of militias and how that all evolved and uh, why we had a, I think it was why we had a, a, a Veterans Day before we had a Memorial Day and just the culture of the country at the time. And uh, good morning. Glad to have you back with us. And, and where would you like to take us today? Uh, good morning. I'd like to actually go back to militias and give a little more information on uh, what they were like. Okay. So the militias, of course, uh, have been in existence in the, in the British colonies uh, from day one. Uh, it's, it was interesting to read some of the something I studied a bit in undergrad, uh, just reading about uh, Virginia's laws on uh, militias uh, before it became before it uh, became part of the United States, and had things like uh, requiring all uh, all colonists, uh, male, uh, to carry and own a musket at all times, mm -hmm. even the church, and <laughs> laws that. Uh, made it illegal to sell muskets to uh, Native Americans at the same time. Okay. So that's... Uh, those laws, of course, uh, changed and uh, were replaced eventually by the time the United States became the United States. And so the first uh, law regarding militias was passed in 1792 uh, that required all... Uh, all white men between the ages of 18 and 45 to serve in the militia of their respective states. Uh, there, was, there are various federal laws uh, uh, changing and updating it, but overall, the militia service was actually quite unpopular. Well, it sounds like it people. was mandatory. <laughs> it makes things unpopular sometimes. Well, it was mandatory that made it unpopular. Uh, it wasn't until uh, 1808 that uh, people in the militia were no longer required to buy their own muskets. Uh, that's That was quite unpopular mm -hmm. uh, because uh, in 1792, uh, people were required to own their own muskets or rifles and their own cartridge boxes and their own powder horns and... 20 rounds of ammunition and uh, that was a burden on some people who couldn't afford any of that. Sure. Uh, the uh, United States tried to uh, make it a little easier um, first by uh, authorizing the United States Army to sell muskets to the states and directly to individual members of the militias. And then in 1808, they revised it further by authorizing the United States to provide all of the uh, uh, arms required for militia service, which uh, was a little more, uh, that, that reduced uh, some of the burden, but that also contributed to uh, some of the early chaos of the Civil War, mm -hmm. because it was up to the uh, Secretary of War to distribute um, firearms to the individual states and Secretary of War uh, John Floyd um, he uh, during his last year as Secretary of War under President Buchanan uh, distributed uh, uh, thousands upon thousands of the most modern recent uh, rifles uh, that the United States was using to uh, southern uh, arsenals <laughs> you might say he was a sympathizer Oh, he uh, eventually became a Confederate general. Okay. Well, he took advantage of his position to benefit his personal interests. Yes, and that's during the war and after the war, veterans uh, continue to call him a traitor and had nothing but uh, hatred for him. Yeah, yeah. Which is understandable because uh, that left uh, the North with a lot of, uh, lot of smoothbore muskets older ones in their arsenals. So I take it the, the technology, if you will, of the weapons developed over time um, from the colonial period up through the Civil War period. I, I, a lot of things I've read is that the, the weapons that we use, the guns, far uh, exceeded the 
the tactics that were used by military commanders at the time. Uh, I don't think that's an uncommon thing. That happens all the time, doesn't it? it yeah, it, it, it does happen quite frequently. Mm -hmm. uh, I see it in uh, many wars in the uh, 1800s, uh, especially as they started uh, developing uh, things like, uh, like uh, shells for artillery for regular artillery instead of uh, just shells for mortars. However, the uh, the training that uh, the soldiers used kind of negated the uh, tech, uh, technological advances. Mm. Because uh, they're still firing volleys, and uh, anybody who's fired a, a weapon needs to has to kind of brace themselves, prepare themselves for firing, make sure their breathing is the right way, or else they're not going to hit their target. And when you're firing volleys, you can't do any of that. You're just staying there shooting when you're told to shoot. Mm -hmm. Assuming you're even uh, trained to use the, uh, the the elevation sights on the muskets. Right. But something else that changed uh, uh, significantly over time was uh, just social attitudes as well. And that was another reason why the militia service was quickly became unpopular. Because uh, the idea that everybody in, in the town would have to enroll with the militia and then turn out uh, once a month to train, well, that sounds like it'd be a good idea, and everybody would uh, vote on their officers, but that did create some problems because this was still an era for the United States when people strongly believed in uh, social status and social standing, and for all the farmers uh, to get together and vote for a fellow farmer to be their officer, that would upset the merchants. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the uh, for if the town is mostly uh, a, a federalist town and somehow an anti-federalist becomes the uh, becomes an officer, well, that will really upset people. Mm -hmm. And the prestigious doctors, they're just not going to show up at all. Right. Well, they're. Well, it's it's war, or it's, yeah, they're they're above that, I guess. And, oh, yeah. peacetime! It's peacetime drills. Peace t peacetime drills. Yeah, they're above that. Yeah, once so. a month, you once a month, you're expected to show up with your muskets. Mm -hmm. But it also was unpopular with uh, with laborers and uh, artisans uh, and just people who, uh, you know, worked hard for a living every day think of the butchers who run butcher shops. Mm -hmm. They have to close down their shop and turn out for militia drill on a Saturday. And they're not paid for it either. Right. And then, as you said, early on, they had to bring their own weapons and ammunition. And uh, that couldn't have been cheap. Oh, no. No, it wasn't. And so, even by the uh, time of the War of 1812, it was starting to unravel. And after the War of 1812, that's when uh, that's when states started changing their rules for militia service, because uh, federal government simply required the existence of militia. They did not uh, provide any sort of rules beyond saying that militias have to use uh, the latest uh, army drill manuals. Mm -hmm. So states started changing things. From some of the things they did was instead of jailing people who didn't show up, they simply fined them which created yet another uh, point of concern for people, which was that wealthy people just paid their way out of serving. <laughs> of course they did. <laughs> and then finally, by the 1840s, the states just kind of gave up altogether and switched from compulsory militia service to voluntary militia service. And I think I asked you this last week. Uh, were, were the militias the precursor to what is now the National Guard, or did the National Guard evolve from the militias and all the issues that the states were having with the militia compliance? Well, the National Guard, um, it's... Well, in 1903, uh, there was yet another militia act that uh, separated out the active militia and the reserve militia, the active militia being the state militia, and they were labeled the National Guard. The reserve militia was uh, any and all men aged 18 to 45. 
okay. would be subject to being called up. But okay. the active militia were the people who actually uh, did drills once a month and would be called up by the states and by the federal government. Uh, there were subsequent uh, acts that uh, changed that even further to changing uh, the uh, state militias to being a reserve uh, formation for the uh, United States Army instead of being strictly a state's organized uh, 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 state-level army. Mm -hmm. And so that is the modern uh, National Guard. Okay. But it just seems like from what you've researched there that in many cases the militias were kind of a burden on the states and not very popular amongst the population. Uh, yes and no. They were, uh, like, individuals disliked the militias, but overall, especially in larger cities, militias were popular. And they sort of took on a, uh, especially in cities where you had a choice of how to serve. Mm -hmm. so, so if you're living out in, uh, like, say you're living out, uh, if Eddy County was uh, transported uh, back uh, 100 years from from the time the Artesia was found in 1905 back to 1805, uh, a small county with a small population, the county would have like one militia company. Mm -hmm. But say New York City, uh, Boston, Richmond, New Orleans, you have large populations, so you have uh, entire regiments of militia and people could choose the unit they could join. Gotcha. And so you'd see things like uh, ethnic militias, the uh, uh, Irish, the Germans, uh, they would form their own militia companies. And so it was bonding. It wasn't just uh, drilling once a month. It was uh, having fun. Uh, right, right, amongst those uh, uh, common common groups. And then, but the militias were run by state-appointed people, or, or were they almost like private entities that were under contract with the state? Oh, no, it was state-appointed, state-funded, state-regulated, state uh, state, okay. uh, everything uh, prior to the, uh, to the Mexican War of 1848. Okay. Uh, and the states would appoint the uh, regimental officers as well, which also created a lot of issues because uh, if a town uh, was mostly uh, Whig, but the governor was a Democratic-Republican, um, odds are pretty high that the regimental officers appointed will not be Whigs. Mm -hmm. And that became a, a, a significant point of issue during the Mexican uh, War of 1846, uh, where unpopular officers were put into place, and that led to situations like uh, mutinies uh, with uh, the Massachusetts regiment that was sent to Mexico. And there was a regiment from uh, North Carolina where the colonel was not of the uh, of the common uh, political party, and so he had multiple riots. And at one point, he had to shoot one of his own men in self-defense. Hmm. Mm -mm -mm. So people only would learn history a little bit more and learn some of these things that, uh, that we have we had issues in the past just like we have issues now and uh, uh, that that is interesting that, uh, that those types of things happen I guess it was that war that was the motivation for the major changes that happened or was it uh, a combination of things well it was mostly the uh, war of 1812 because because uh, during that war, the United States had, uh, if I remember correctly, they had there, there was like four regiments of infantry and some scattered batteries of artillery here and there, but that was it. Yeah. And they tried to mobilize the uh, militias, and the militias did not want to cross uh, state lines. So the United States formed, uh, I believe, a total of 48 infantry regiments and four rifle regiments. And after the war, they consolidated them down to uh, just eight regiments. But it was, uh, but they realized that they had to have uh, volunteers, and they had to have federal soldiers. That the militia system wasn't good enough. But 
after the war, there was little political will for maintaining a standing army again. Because mm-hmm. people forget. Yeah. It was the same thing after the American Revolution. They uh, disbanded the Continental Army and then suddenly discovered, uh, like with St. Clair's disaster, that the militias just weren't functional enough to fight. Right. And you had to be ready for uh, for that when that situation presented itself. Michael, we've got about 30 seconds left. Uh, you do have your exhibit uh, open for folks to come and see the fashionable fashions of uh, uh, fatherly fashions <laughs> i'm the sorry fashionable founding fathers all right i knew fashionable was in there and fathers was in there <laughs> how's that been received oh we've we've had some people uh you know stop by and give uh, pretty good compliments on it excellent it's it's an interesting exhibit the menswear of 1905 